a lot of people who meet me for the first time always at some point go, you're not what I, what I thought you'd be. And when I ask, what do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, well, I thought you was going to be flash. I thought you was going to be arrogant. Would you believe it? It's Anton Ferdinand who scored against his brother's team. What a story. Football talk about mental health. Fantastic. Everyone's talking about it, talking more about it. But do you know what no one don't talk about? What can you say about it today? It happened for a reason, and I didn't understand it until I went through the situation with John Terry, which is why I wanted John Terry in the documentary, because he got his own views. So having his side, it wasn't, if him being on the documentary with me wasn't about whether he was guilty or not guilty, or whether for him to say sorry or not, or admit it, I didn't care about that. I know deep down what, what's what. There are unscrupulous individuals out there who are taking young footballers for granted. For granted. Kids are being sold the same dream, but with a club knowing that they're not going to make Welcome to the Second Chance Podcast. I'm your host, Raphael Rowe. On this podcast, we talk to people from diverse backgrounds who share their stories of redemption, resilience, and second chance. Go to our YouTube channel so you can watch those interviews, subscribe, share, and click on the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. Anton, thanks for coming in and joining me. No problem. Me. Thanks for having me. Do you know, I don't think I've had anybody on the podcast who's from Peckham, my neck of the woods, although I grew up in Camberwell, which is, you know, Stone's Throw, Camberwell, yeah. Peckham, Brixton. I used, although, to go, I used to go to the uh, swimming baths. In Camberwell? Yeah. yeah. So did I, man, but you're much younger than me, so I probably didn't grace it at yeah, that time. My, my dad... I used to say, you say to me, oh, let's go, say to me, Maria, let's go swimming. And I go, yeah, yeah, and I get there and I refuse to go in. Why, I've done it twice, he's chucked me in on the, on the third time. Is it because it was a bad swimming pool or just because you didn't like swimming? I just, there was a fear there. And I don't, I, I don't have one now, but it was just like, I got, I got there and it was almost like stage fright. And then third time I went there, my dad just said, nope, you're going in. And he just dashed me in. You <laughs> <laughs> learned to swim from that. Exactly. Lots of things have been written about you as a footballer, as an individual who's endured things off the pitch as well as on the pitch. Um, so people read lots of stuff about Anton. I always like to start by asking my guests to tell me who they are, as opposed to what's been written about you, the narrative that's been given by the media in many different ways throughout your career as a footballer and as an individual, as a man, as a parent, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So how do you describe yourself? Um, it's funny. It's, it's, it's hard to, to do that. Um, but what I will say is a lot of people who meet me for the first time always at some point go, you're not what I, what I thought you'd be. You're not who I thought you'd be, which tells a story that there's a narrative that's been written about me for many, many years of someone. And when I ask, what do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, well, I thought you was going to be flash. I thought you were going to be arrogant. And that's always been the narrative that's been run on me, you know, as well as a liar you know, and, and, and so on and so on. Um, but when people sit down and actually chat to me, look in the whites of my eyes, they see a different Anton, which in my own words is someone who's wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, I don't do things unless I'm fully invested in it because unless I'm fully invested in it, you won't get the real me. You won't get the, you won't get the offense. Oh, I can't even say the word. Authenticity. Yes, there you go. Thank you. You won't get that from me, which I think is, is an important thing when dealing with certain things and, and especially stuff that I'm involved in today, which is mentoring to the next generation of footballers um, that are coming through at New Era Global Sports Management, giving people something from my own personal experiences. I've never done a mentoring course. I don't believe I need to do one because I've been there, done it, worn a t-shirt within football. Mm. And any mentoring, any mentorship that I give to somebody always comes from a place of experience. And if I haven't experienced it, which is very unlikely, because if you looked into me, looked through my career and stuff that has been in the papers, I've been through probably any, most things, fights with managers, fights with players, you know, stuff on the pitch, off the pitch. I've been through all of it more than most most footballers, I would say. Um, but if I don't know what it is or that feeling, because I go on feelings more than anything, if I don't have that that connection to a feeling of of 
of my personal experience, I'll go and get it from somebody else. And if well, that... Where's that come from? Where's it, where's it come from? Because I suppose the image people have of footballers is that you are trained by a PR team not to show emotion, not to wear your heart on the sleeve, be very calculated in what you say and don't say in front of a camera. When you're talking about football and the game itself that you just played it's very in, regimented. Very regimented, but you're very open and you say that from the outset. Where's that come from? It's from, uh, I'd say, since retiring. But... I've always, if you, if my dad was sitting here today, he'd probably say, out of all of these kids, I'm probably the one that's more emotional and and more outspoken to than than all the others. Um, so it's always been in me. Um, but like you said, when you do play football, you're told what to say, when to say it. And as you see on TV now, when people do interviews, every answer is really the same. You know what someone's going to say before they say it. How do you think the game went today? Mm -hmm. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, the lads were great. Got the three points. Fans were unbelievable. That's the answer that you get. It's just a different person saying it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whereas now, especially since doing the documentary, where I was having to narrate my own story, which was very hard, by the way, um, even though I know the story inside out, because it's my truth, um, to now go from being told what to say, when to say it, to now being free to speak how I want to speak and how I want to speak. I find it very, very hard. And if you used to, you do documentaries, so you understand. Mm -hmm. If you just look at the rushes early on, you'd see a different Anton where I was get trying to come out of that mode. Right. You know, and, and, and I, at first I found it very, very hard. Is that because you were being protective of your career because you were coming out of your career? Or is it because you were being protective of your private life and things that you had to deal with yourself in your private moments? Yeah, there was there was both. I think when the incident happened, I was almost put into a box and I'd played 11 years in the Premier League prior to that. And after that, I played 13 times in the Premier League and was never seen in the Premier League again. So my thought process was, if they can do that to me when I'm in control of my talent, what can they do to me now I don't have control of my ta talent? What could they do to me now? You know, would they put me in a in a box and I'll never be seen again in terms of media work and stuff like that, which is what I wanted to go into and what I was going into. Um, but also the other side of it, my wife didn't want me to do the documentary because she had witnessed and been through stuff that I'd gone through at the time of the incident, being walking down the street, me and my wife and people shouting obscenities, you know, um, and stuff like that. And she had been through it with me. But the difference now, it wasn't just, it's not just me and her, we've got kids. So now we're walking the street with the kids. And she was thinking, would that rearest old head, don't need our kids hearing that. So she didn't really want me to do it at first, but understood why I was doing it, which ultimately overpowered her fears of doing it. And that's credit to her as a woman and as a mother. Why? Why did you do it then? Because I was sick and tired of people create, um, run, running the narrative on me and controlling my narrative. I was in a place where I was ready to talk. And I had to lose my mum to get to that place. You know, I was angry for a, lot, for a long, long time. But I had to lose my mum to be soft enough to give a balanced a balance on my truth in terms of, so example, if there was anger in my delivery, only certain people are going to take on what I'm saying. But if there's not that anger, it will reach more people. You know, I'm a firm believer that when you're delivering a message, if, if it isn't clear and concise, it can get, interpreted different ways it can get um misconstrued and the topic's bigger than me this topic's bigger than me it's bigger than, than than all of us and it's for the next generation of people coming through good kids coming through including my own kids so it needs i need to be in a place where i was ready to do it and not just that to represent my parents in the right way who went through stuff for me and my brothers and sisters my mum's a white woman who endured racial abuse 
because she fell in love with a black man. That's her story. I need to be able to convey my story, which represents her as well as my dad, who's a black man who fell in love with a white woman who got racism. So for me to speak openly about it, I wanted my documentary to be different to every single person that I've seen make a documentary about racism. And did it work? Because I'm, I'm in the same situation. My mum's a white woman, married a black man in the 60s, you, mm -hmm. you know, um, lost my dad recently. Never spoken to my mum about the racism she endured. She's never spoken about it, even to this day. And I don't know how I'd approach that conversation. I know that they did. I know my dad's been attacked by people on the streets and beaten as a black man mm -hmm. um, because they were racist towards him. Do you think it has done what you set it out to? Because most people, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, Anton, but most people might believe or thought at the time that what you did was driven by the John Terry incident. But it's bigger than that, as you just said. It's yeah. much wider and it existed long before that on-pitch incident. Do you think people have learned from that based on the response you've had from people? I think it's educated uh, a lot of people. And the reason why I say that is because when people stop me, when I'm, I forget, I'll give you an example, I was in B&Q not long after the, the documentary came out and we was in COVID at the time, which made it a little bit harder because we was in COVID, wasn't out as much. So didn't quite gauge the impact that it really had. But I still get messages today you know, years on, uh, three years on of people saying, I've just watched your documentary. It's changed my life. This is unbelievable and stuff like that, which tells me the impact that it's made. But I was in B&Q and um, the reason why I wanted white people in my documentary speaking about racism the same way that you and me see it or people of dark heritage see racism and know the feeling by the way, because we know the feeling to speak about racism on my documentaries because there's always this saying of, oh, you're, he's a broken record or she's a broken record. Mm. They're mm. broken records. Mm. Okay, well, hear, what, hear from someone who looks like you then, Who's, who don't understand the feeling, but they're, 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 they're open enough to try, and under, to try and understand it. They'll never know the feeling, but to try and understand it, their minds are open enough. Hear it from a person who looks like you then. Because in society, the oppressor will never oppress their own, is the way that I see it, because they can't afford to. Because the minute they start oppressing their own, it lets, it lets us in. And that's the one thing they don't want. So when their own start talking about it, they go, oh, I better listen. And that's how I see it. So that's why I made the documentary in the way that I wanted to make it. And going back to my story in B&Q, a white man in his 60s, I had a mask on, he was like, it's you, in it?" And I was like, uh, who? And he went, the documentary. And I went, oh, okay. Um, yeah, he went, I've got to say, Anton, I'm in my 60s and you educated me. But it wasn't my words who educated him. I went, okay, what, what bit was it? He went, when Neil Warnock, who was my manager at the time, said, years ago, I said things that I'm not proud of, but I've educated myself and I've moved with the times and I would never say that stuff now. I can relate to that. And it checked me to go, I need to sort myself out. It wasn't what I said. It was someone that looked like him that said it. You know, and, and, and so it made me understand and realise that the way that I see things, I'm not saying it's 100% the truth, but it's my version of the way I see society and the way I see the world is the oppressor will never oppress their own. Because if they do, they'll do the what it will do the one thing that they don't want, which is to allow us in. But if someone who looks like me is speaking in a certain way, that may end up letting the people that I don't want in the inner circle, I better start listening. Mm, it educates them. How, 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 how does it, because I know it works for me growing up in a, I don't know, mixed race household, whatever they want to call it today, because it changes every mm -hmm. so generation. And I've always had this kind of clash with my sisters in the nicest possible way where they consider themselves more black than they do white. And I've always considered myself between the two. You know, I love my mum as much as I did my dad do my dad um 
where does it sit with you? Do you think this is this is my upbringing? My mum, as a white woman, made me understand that society will see me as a black male. Nothing more, nothing less. If I walk down the street, they're not going to look at you and go, oh, there's that mixed race boy or there's that white boy. They're going to go, there's that black boy. Yeah, of course. So my mum, growing up in Peckham, mm -hmm. next to Bermondsey, made sure me and Rio knew and understood that society would see us as black. And, and just for the record, Bermondsey was noted for its element yes. of racism. Yes. I'm not saying Millwall or anything like that. I'm <laughs> just sort of saying in that region. Yeah. My sister lives in Bermondsey now, so yeah. I, I know it well. So... Because of that, we were known, we were brought up to know and to identify as black males. Mm. But that doesn't mean that I don't know the white heritage, the white side of my family or the white heritage. I use this analogy all the time. I know rice and peas and I know pie mash. Mm. And, I, and mm. I love both. Mm. But if I walk down the street, people ain't gonna look at me and go, there's that white boy. They've never been called or, white. They've never been I'm, called a black. Exactly. Mm. Never been called mm. a mixed race one either. No. No. Only black. Yeah. So as far as I'm sitting here, I sit here as a black male. I first came across you, not because of your football prowess. I mean, I was aware of that. I was a big West Ham fan, Chelsea fan, you know, watch you play football all my life. But I think you probably won't even remember this, but I was making a documentary and I turned up at your court case where you were defending yourself when someone tried to take your watch. Yeah. And I remember being in the court watching all the proceedings, you got the not guilty, you got acquitted, and you walked out. What was that experience like for you? Because you're a pro footballer, you know, at the height of your career. I don't know if it was at the point where Barcelona were even making noises at this time, but, you know, you were you were up there. Yeah. What, what was it like going through something that was dragging you? I say dragging, you might have experienced it very differently, but I just remember being an observer who's trying to make a document, trying to get into your life to understand the challenges that footballers, successful footballers face from the outside forces, whether it's people trying to bribe you or whatever it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like for you? It happened for a reason, and I didn't understand it until I went through the situation with John Terry. If I hadn't been in court, in the dock at that time for somebody trying to nick my watch. When I went to the dock, however many years later, I would have struggled. I would have absolutely struggled in, in the dock. So I'm sitting now, and you know when they say things happen for a reason? Mm. At the time I was like, why is this happening to me? But years later I understood why. What it done to me, um, my get out was football. When I played football, I didn't think about it. So I was lucky in that sense. But being told, Anton, you better bring a bag tomorrow when it comes to the last day when they're summing up and concluding and your brief is telling you, you better bring a bag tomorrow because you might not be coming out. You might be going down, down the stairs from the verdict. Like that is 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 obviously you un you understand it. It's it's chilling and it's terrifying. And I'm thinking well, my career could be done. I could be going to prison. And I'm not going to see my family for a while. And when I was in, when I was in behind the door when the verdict was coming. So little things happened that were crazy, like literally 90 minutes after the closing was when the jury came back out. Like 90 minutes is a football match. You know, and, and I remember being behind the door where the stairs are to go down to the cells. And I was pacing back and forth. And it's only like, not even the size of this table behind there, and I'm pacing, nervous, sweating. And I came out, and then the jury came out, and I'm, I was just looking at my mum. And my mum went from being nervous to being calm. And when I saw that, I was like, I'm all right. I don't know why. My mum just had that effect on me. When I, when I saw my mum go from 
looking agitated to all of a sudden being calm. Um, I just knew I was going to be okay. And that was the sign that I needed. That's what I was looking for. And it just, and it just came. Um, but my mum had a major part to play in why the case went the way that it went. One, because I wasn't guilty, because the guy tried to nick my watch and we ended up having a fight. And two, the jurors that were there doing the case, one of them tried at lunch, one of them a few days before, prior to the, to the um, summons up, the summing up, came to try to come and speak to me. And you know, if you do that normally, the yeah, case, yep, yep. And, and because the case wasn't going well for the CPS at the time, they tried to get chucked out. But before the CPS could go in it, my mum went in and saw the judge and said, look, this is what's happened. The, uh, one of the jurors came to, came to Anton, um, but I want to, I want to be the, as his mum, I want to be the one to tell you this is what's happened. Okay. And based on my mum going in there and saying that, he allowed the case to go on mm. rather than getting a whole new jury, mm. you know, and I never knew that until after. That was successful. And you mentioned that that was a prelude, if you like, a beginning of preparing you for what happened when you next found yourself in a court case, only this time you were not the accused, you were the accuser in, in the case. Yeah. And a lot happened, you know, I'm a big football fan, you, you know, and I remember the game, I was watching the game when the incident happened. I hope you don't mind talking about it because a lot has happened and, you know, it triggered a lot of difficult feelings for people, especially football fans who want to believe something, didn't want to believe something, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what can you say about it today, Anton? Because Terry, as a player, gets found not guilty in the court case. But then there's this report, and I'm aware of the report. Many people might not be aware of the report, which completely condemns him in terms of what he did and didn't do. What can you talk about it or say about it now, about that incident? One, about what happened, but two, how it follows you. Because right now I'm asking you a question about it. You know, is it something that you want to put behind you? Is it something that people need to be aware of constantly that this happens on the pitch? Um, I'm comfortable with both. I'm co this reason why I made a documentary is because it needs to stay present. It needs to be a case where the FA can look back at stuff and go, this is the way not to deal with it, which is a big thing for me, which is why I wanted John Terry in the documentary because he got his own views where he probably feels aggrieved that he was treat, uh, treat and, uh, treated wrong. So having his side, it wasn't, if him being on the documentary with me wasn't about whether he was guilty or not guilty or whether for him to say sorry or not or admit it, I didn't care about that. I, as I said earlier, as I alluded to earlier, it's bigger than me and him. He'd gone past all of that. I, didn't, I don't care about whether he admits stuff or not. I know deep down what, what's what, you know? But it was so that the footballing bodies could understand how not to deal with a case if it happened again. Because I don't want any player that plays now going through the same thing that I went through. And him, if, if, if he went through anything. And I'm supposing he did. I'm, I'm, I'm actually guarantee, I'm guaranteeing that he did because there's two sides to a story and everyone has feelings. But it following me now, I mean, it's, it's why we're sitting here talking, because it's a topic that needs to be spoken about. It needs to continue to be spoken about, because is it getting better in society? Not really. Is it getting better in football? Not really. So it needs to continue to, get, to be spoken about. It's the biggest racism case in, fo in football that's ever been, other than like the iconic... Uh, John Barnes mm. picture with him flicking up the banana mm. and stuff like that of how it was in the 60s. But in the present, when, when we shouldn't really be speaking about racism really, it's the biggest one worldwide. So who am I to not speak openly about a situation that affected me and my family 
when it can help others. That's not the way I was brought up. That's not, that's not the way our family works. I'm a representation of my mum and my dad. Mm. And the representation is we help people as we see fit and how, how we, we possibly can. And giving someone my living experience in a topical conversation that happens regularly, who am I not to do that? What did you feel about the outcome then of the court case? Because it was obvious to anybody who looked at it openly, dispassionately, what, what went on. I'll never understand it. No matter how many people try to explain it to me, I'll never understand it. And being in trouble with the law before, I understand certain aspects of the law. There's a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes that I can't speak about. Mm. Um, but for a judge to, in, his, in his summons up to say, I believed Anton 100% in everything that he said, and he's a credible witness. But the reason why I can't find John Terry um, guilty is because the CPS didn't make me feel, the, the prosecution didn't make me, make me feel that he was lying enough for me to say he was guilty. Something's wrong there then. In my opinion, something's wrong. What does society take from that? Society says, and we know how people look at it. And the biggest thing, and I said this to the FA before, if this ain't dealt with properly, because of the stature of the person that's involved in this, the way society looks at it, if he can do it, so can I. Mm. If he can get away with it, so can I. Mm. This is how big it is. When you're in, this is how big it is. Because you know how society looks at things, and especially with freedom of speech and, and mm. stuff like that, as we've seen over the last few weeks and, and, and months. Um, that's the way people look at things. And I, I said, if this ain't dealt with properly, we're opening a can of worms because of how big he is. In the face of English football at the time. And if it ain't nipped in the bud and dealt with properly, then there's some serious problems that we're gonna we're gonna encounter. And you say very little has changed in, in football, very little has changed. I mean, I'm sure there have been huge changes. Yeah, there has there, been. There, because people are speaking out, they're taking your lead, they're being inspired by what you did and how you stood up for it and how your brother has and how other footballers have, where where it's been necessary, you, you, you know, especially in games abroad where it's yeah. pretty obvious, you know, the barrage of racism but the fact that you and I are sitting here right now and I can feel the passion I can feel there is still some underlining anger in you there is you know you, know, you said from the beginning you wear your heart on your sleeve you're emotional and that comes across it comes across that you're talking about things that happened years ago that affected your life your families your existence to this day how do we move on then how do you move on I'm, I'm a, uh, as much as I speak passionately I'm at peace. Okay. I'm, and the documentary done that to me. I didn't go into the documentary thinking it was going to be therapeutic. But it became a therapeutic um, process for me. To the point where I would film all day, I'd come home and I'd go straight to sleep. Because so much was coming off of me. And it ended up, what, it ended up making me, so I went through stages, when my mum died, I went through stages where I'd go every four, five months, my day would start at two, three o'clock in the morning. Cause I'd wake up and I can't sleep. I'm fighting, I'm, f I'm rolling, I'm tussling with myself, tussling with my mind and couldn't sleep and I weren't sleeping. And then I'd, I'd sleep for a week, fine. And then I'll be at it again. Or then I'll sleep fine for a month and then all of a sudden I'm fighting again. And I went through a, um, a lot of that. And it wasn't until I watched the, the first edit of the documentary, I watched it and things that were in my subconscious brain came to the forefront where I was able to deal with it. You mean things that you suppressed? For, no, things like, so for example, like I don't sit here and say I'm not stupid. I don't sit here and say, my mum passed away from cancer because of what happened with me and John Terry. But the facts are, my mum's first 
battle with cancer was due to stress not being able to help me around the court case and me going through things off the pitch, going to, to different stadiums, getting booed. Everywhere I went, every time I looked at my Twitter, my social media, the abuse, the, the hate mail that I got. My mum, my mum, the matriarch of the family, she was in control. And all of a sudden she had no control on how I was feeling and how I was dealing with things. I thought I was okay, but she as my mother could see that I wasn't. Of course. But she had no control, which, you know, they say stress is one of the biggest killers. Stress is what brings on can things like cancer and other diseases. So I know that around that time when she had her first um, dealing with cancer was due to the stress of the court case. Subconsciously, in my mind, for years, I must have been thinking the racism case is the reason why she's not here. Mm. But it wasn't until I watched the documentary that it just hit me. And I didn't know that thought because it was subconscious. I didn't know that it was, that that's what it was. But it came to the forefront and I was able to deal with it and I've slept perfectly ever since, which is a big thing for me. So it was therapeutic in that way. And I remember my last, one thing I'll never, ever, ever forget, my last day of filming at West Ham. And it's the, it's the last scene in the documentary where mm -hmm. I'm speaking to the young kids, mm -hmm. the under 23s and, and the youth team, giving them my version of, not version of what happened, but if they was to ever go through something like what I went through, I'm here, you can chat to me. I'm open. This is why I'm making a documentary to help you guys. And I remember doing my last cutaways and my last summons up, my last summary mm. of the day. Mm. It was my last ever scene. And I'm doing, I'm sitting on the, on the, um, a little cart. And I'm talking to the camera. And then what he wanted me to do is after I finished, just walk, mm. walk past the camera mm. and walk to the halfway line. And I'm doing it. And I, then I, I said what I needed to say. And I just started walking. And I remember just looking at the sky going, mum, I've done it. Mum, and the tears that were coming down my face. I'll never ever forget it. Like the, what come off of me, how everything come off of me. I just remember thinking I've done it. Mum, mum, I've done it. And I felt a, a, a sense of pr being proud, which must have been her. Like, to me, I, I interpreted that as she's proud of me because I felt an a, a, a energy of, of proudness when I was look, walking, looking at the sky, saying these things and tears rolling down my eyes. And I'll never, ever forget it. That's so powerful. Uh, and what about your wife, who was hesitant about you making the, the documentary at the time because she was fearful of the impact it would have on your children, who are now in the world, and, and her, uh, and you, because of what you'd endured up until that point. When she watched the documentary, what was her reaction? For her to actually step foot and be in it mm. was a massive thing for her. She don't like cameras. She don't like all that type mm. of stuff. But she understood why I was doing a documentary to help other people. So her story and the way she saw it was important because as a, as a, a woman who's married to somebody who's in the public eye receiving this abuse, her story is something in its own. Mm that can help people. So she understood that and she didn't want to be in a documentary, but understood why it was important for her to be in it. So for her to just be in it and speak about it from a wife's point of view on the situation, says everything and, and, and so I'm lucky to have the, the wife that I've got who has been with me through thick and thin and there's not many people that can say that. I mean, not people, many people that can say like, if I lost all my money tomorrow, I know my wife would be standing there next to me mm. because that's how she was brought up. I remember that scene. I don't remember the bit you walk in and, you know, looking up into the sky, that's a private moment, right? But I remember looking at those kids who were listening to you intently as you spoke to them about, you know, speaking up, standing up. 
And I just remember seeing fear in their face. You know that not 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 the fear of racism, mm -hmm. but the fear of doing what you do because of the impact it might have on their career if they dare, you know, challenge anything at such an early part where they were still trying to break through and be who you are yeah. were and other footballers um, who had been successful sorry in such to, a challenge. Sorry to cut you just on that point there. I think there's a difference now. There is fear because people will listen to my story and go, do you know what? I don't want to go through what he went through. Mm. And them hearing things firsthand, there is going to be that initial fear. But what I would say, the difference is, when I was going through it, it wasn't spoken about. Now it's openly spoken about. And that's the reason why I believe I never got a football club after it, was because of t the taboo of talking about racism. It wasn't something that people were comfortable speaking about. So anytime, if I stayed in the Premier League, anytime I played against Chelsea mm. or I played against John Terry, the club that I'm at would have to speak about racism mm. and they didn't want to. Right. Whereas now it's open mm. or more open, I should say. And it's not a taboo to speak about it. People are more comfortable speaking about it. Mm. And I truly believe, I'm not saying just because of my documentary, but people seeing people of white heritage speaking about racism the same way we speak about it is a great help. Mm. And I'm not saying racism one way, it's both ways. Yeah, of course. So let's put that on the table now. Yeah. I'm not saying racism, but how I know it. I know it both ways. I've had black people be racist to me. White people be racist to me. My grandmother, my dark, dark, the darkest um, cousins, I'd go to the house, they'd get a fiver, I'd get a pound. I mm. never saw it at the time. Mm. They'd get a hot meal, I'd get a sandwich. But do you think that was deliberate? And let me ask you this question. Have you ever been racist to anybody? Unconsciously or consciously? I ask myself that all the time. And, and it might be, sometimes I liken it to prejudice. I'm prejudiced towards a particular person for some reason without even realising it. And I have to check myself. In the same way you said that 60-year-old and being I think cute. everybody's like that. Yeah. But I don't look at someone unless you use something light. Well, not let I say something lighter. So I don't look at somebody and go, you ginger see you next Tuesday. Mm. You're just a C next Tuesday, that's it. Mm. I don't look at their features and add, their, add a feature to, to the word. I don't do that. It's not in me to, it's not mm. in my thought process to do that. You're just a C next Tuesday, that's mm. it. Mm. And this is why it's, it is learnt behaviour. If I was around people who was saying, are oh, you ginger this, or you, or you black this, or you, you are a product of, you're a product of your environment. You become a product of your environment. That's what it's learnt behavior. My dad, when he lived in St. Lucia, before he came to England, he never knew about race. He never knew, he never saw racism. He never heard racism. He never knew like white, black. He just never saw it. There was a white woman who owned the corner shop in his village in St. Lucia, he didn't realise she was white until he came to England. And people started... Because people mm. people mm. separate the two. Mm. Whereas in St. Lucia, they never... She was just Miss Jones or whatever her name was. They just used manners and said, Miss so-and-so. Look, oh, there's the white woman. No, never done that. But again, when you come... To, when they when came to England, I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. The racism is both ways. It becomes learnt behaviour. Mm. You're not, do you understand what mm, I mean? I do. Yeah. I always, I always, when I, I growing up in the same household as yourself, you know, my dad, black Jamaican, my mum, white Londoner, um, and the abuse they gave each other of calling each other white, this, black, this, out of love, mm -hmm. you know, in an argument, made me immune to racism yeah. because I, I thought never, it was to equal. To be fair, I never experienced that. Yeah, that was my, my equaliser. It was my equaliser because if I saw my dad cussing my mum or my mum cussing my dad, I thought it was just a natural thing that people just, when I heard it on the street, I didn't liken it to, to racism. I just likened it to two people of a different culture having a go at each other. It's only as you get older, you start to equate words. 
I, I want to ask you this. You, you, you mentioned, Anton, that um, because of what happened with John Terry, it affected your footballing career. How did it affect your footballing career? I mean, on the pitch, so not the abuse you got from people, but I mean your career as a footballer, you know, going on to play for more Premier League clubs, etc. Yeah, I never, I played 13 games of that after that uh, incident uh, in the Premier League and never played in the Premier League again. And that's when I had to move to Turkey because no club wanted me. Um, is it as bad as that? I didn't realise yeah. that. Yeah, that's why. That's the only reason why I went to Turkey. You know, and, and I don't regret going to Turkey. I had a fantastic time there. And especially in my first period there on loan at Bursa I had an unbelievable time the second year at Antalya Sport One it was great. Mm. Um, became more like a holiday um, than, than anything because How I, old was because you at I the wasn't time? playing. 26, 27. So I your think. prime, really? I'm coming to my prime years and I'm not playing in the Premier League. I've done all the hard work to get to the Premier League, to establish myself in the Premier League. Looking forward to my pri my prime years, and I never had them at the top. And as I said earlier, I think the reason why is because of the taboo of speaking about racism around that time. Twitter was was new at the time, so again, like footballers today, control the narrative by the f tips of their fingers. Mm -hmm. Didn't have to, I, Twitter weren't known for that. It was it was new. It was a new platform. So I didn't. We didn't understand how to use social media. Everything was controlled by the red tops. And as I learned in doing the press run for my documentary, where I'd question a lot of the reporters, what's the, and I'd say, what's the headline going to be? I need to, I want to know what the headline's going to be. And then you, you all of a sudden understand that they don't create the headline. They just do the, the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. article. Yeah. And they're saying, why are you asking? I said, because the headline and the caption is what controls the narrative. How many people you know pick up the, the red top and read the actual article? They don't. They read the, the headline, the caption, and they base their opinion on them two mm. things. Mm. If you read the article, it's nothing like what the, the headline and the caption says. Do you know what that does to people? It allows people to control the narrative mm. on you. Do you understand what that, how, the ripple effect that has on you, the person and their family? No, well, I'm going to tell you. My siblings are going to school getting abused because of the narrative that's being run on me. And that could happen again. My kids are going to school could happen to them. But they don't have control on the headline or the caption. Mm -hmm. But the red tops don't understand that. They do understand it, but it's, do they want to do anything about it? And that's what I've learned since retiring, since doing documentary. That's one thing that I've learned, especially within football, is a lot of people say the right things, but do they do the right things? Mm -hmm. No, they don't. The example is taking a knee. Right. The taking a knee situation could have been dealt with so much better in terms of the messaging. The reason why people, a lot of people booed it is because the messaging weren't clear, in my opinion. Okay. So every entity has a different message because they want to be the one that's seen to be leading it. So it's, it's, football's filled with egos. So everyone wants to be the one who creates the change rather than coming together. This is the wording, but just have it on. The, and every, it's, one, it's one paragraph and it's the same on every single um, headed paper, but the headed paper is different. When there's mixed messages and different wording, it gives people an out. What got lost then? What got lost in that messaging? Because people saw the images of players managers, coaches, referees going down on one knee. and The it's reason to... why it's being done, it's a powerful message because it keeps the conversation going. Mm. Mm. We're not doing it to go, oh, black power. No, no, it's to keep the messaging, it's to keep the conversation going. How can you educate people if the conversation is dead? It's impossible. But is that because of the red top type media narrative, they changed it from what it was supposed to be to what they 
wanted to. But it's all, it's almost like football became that. Yeah. Mm. Use one paragraph that explains why the footballers are doing it. The reason why we're doing it is because kids around the world are going to see that image and they're going to ask their parents, why are they doing that, mm. dad? Or mum? Opens a conversation. Conversation continues. Mm. It's now your job as a parent to convey that message in the right way. But if that was said and it was there and it was done and every entity had the same word in, just the, the, heading pa the headed paper was different. When Mia Wall got done for, for booing it mm. as a club, their get out was we didn't know who to listen to. Mm. You can't find someone guilty based on that. Because mm. as we know, it's unreasonable doubt in, in stuff. Mm. There's grey areas. When it's one word, when it's one thing, and everyone, there's no grey areas. There's none. Football have a lot. The football talk about mental health. Fantastic. Everyone's talking about it. They're talking more about it. But do you know what no one don't talk about? What's the what's the cause of it? What's the root? Why are we not talking about the the cause? Fantastic that we're lifting people up and going. Oh, it's fantastic that you're speaking about mm. it. But what's the cure? Why aren't we giving these young lads financial advice? Because a lot of it's finances. A lot of it is kids are being sold the same dream, but with a club knowing that they're not going to make it. But they're sold this. So how an academy looks and how it works. In every age group, there'll be four that they see that can go on. Four players. Four players. Yeah. Your brother did a really good documentary about this, didn't he? Exactly. Down, down at Palace. And, exactly. Yeah. So there might be 16 in a squad. Four of them in every squad are the ones who they think are the ones who mm. could go and be sold for 100 million, which that 100 million will pay for the academy for the next 20 years. Yeah. So that four, the other um, 11... I sold the same dream as the four, by the way. You can break into the four if one of the four mm. ain't doing as well. Mm. There's, there's, there's room to move mm. Mm. in there. Mm. Not saying there isn't, there is. But then all of a sudden you start to get to the 17 years old and now you can sign a pro contract. And that pro contract might be five grand a week. It's a lot of money for a 17 year old. But that 17 year old don't know, understand don't understand money properly, don't understand debt properly, don't understand mortgages, don't understand that the minute you go and get a phone, it's a debt because the contract's a debt. Don't understand little things like that. They don't understand that, okay, you've got to buy a car. The car might be a thousand pound a month, but because of your age and your occupation, your insurance is going to be two grand a mm -hmm. month mm -hmm. that you've got to pay. And by the way, can you afford if, to, if, if for instance, you need tyres, tire, some tyres, it might be £300 for one tyre. The impression, the impression people get, though, is that all of that is taken no. care of by the football clubs. That's the no. impression. I think that's what's on no. the street. The impression is that these young footballers are being muddy-coddled. I mean, maybe the four are. They are being muddy-coddled, muddy but they're being muddy-coddled not to understand... There's a difference. Being muddy cuddled, but being told, not being told, learning how to deal with stuff, or being muddy cuddled and it being done for you. But surely players like yourself who came from a different era, your brother and other players, that you are leading that education for mm -hmm. players today, who was there when you were going through it. So I, I'm under the impression that lots of these young kids are in the academies now have people like you nope. who have lived that life, have experienced that negative knee around finances that you're kind nope. of putting them in the right direction now and making them aware that the money they're making, they need to take care of it or their parents need to be aware that this money that's coming from nowhere all of a sudden to give them the riches needs to be managed. Nope. And that's what I'm saying. Who's going to the root of the problem? So when a player gets released, they, they might have been on five grand a week. 
Yeah, all of a sudden now, that person at 17 years old is the biggest breadwinner in their family. There's financial pressure on that, that young person because they might have bought a house for 400 grand for their parents because that's what you want to do. But all of a sudden now, you've not played no games. So where do you go from there? Where are you going to get five grand a week? Because when you go down to lower, lower it's, it's 1,500 pound a week because you ain't playing, you've got no experience. All of a sudden, that's a big deficit from five grand a week to 1,500 pound a week. Got bills, but you're the main, your mum and dad can't help you because you earn more money than them, still. Mm. It's financial pressure. So what happens. Then you wonder why, but there's some players that ain't played no, no games. They're on £1,500 a week and they get released, but they're just not good enough to even have a career or injury. And they go from earning money to not earning money. Why are we not dealing with these kids? What is the solution then? The solution, I think personally, in my personal opinion, is I think kids need financial literacy. I think the parents should have it as well because you got to look, kids are moving for 100 grand at, at, at 9, 10, 11 years old nowadays, you know? And I think that understanding and learning about money, like I, I, it wasn't until I retired that I started to understand the difference between rich and wealth, wealthy. Footballers are rich, they're not wealthy. What would you mean by that? Wealth is generational. Rich is having money here and now. Footballers have money here and now, but they've also got lifestyles that equate that money. And how, what, what do you mean that you only discovered that in retirement? Because then when you start going into the business world, the, comp the, 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 the literacy, the, 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 the wording is different. The way people speak is different. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get a, I'm, we're gonna go here, we're gonna get on a private jet. Can you afford that private jet? Three times over. Not from the money coming in, I'm talking your, your savings, and still be comfortable. If you can't, why are you getting a, why are you getting a private jet for? Right. The terminology is different. Mm. They're looking at the future, looking at now. Footballers live for the now. So there might be people that are on 100 grand a week, but they live a 100 grand a week lifestyle. What do clubs do then to, to, to educate footballers? Or do you think it's the club's responsibility? I think, I think it's football as a whole. We, we've got a fantastic um, organisation within the PFA which I know is fantastic because when I played in Turkey, they don't have uh, an association for the players. Mm. So if players lose money or the club don't want to pay a player, they can get away with it because there's no one holding them account. Whereas in England, you can because of the Professional Football Association. But how they haven't got a group, a pool of financial advisors who are regulated by them where they're signing indemn indemnities, where if you put our players in something that is going to earn you money, but it's risky for them, and it goes tits up, you're out of the circle. You're in trouble, and we can come after you. Mm. Financial advisors are still going to be in that pool because of what's attached to football, money, and being in the public eye. Mm. Now, if you go, to, if you went in, if you took a bond, for instance, if you had a bond and you dressed it up beautifully and you went into Canary Wolf and you was going into, into people who like to invest and you go, look, I've got this bond and this, this and you dress it up properly. And then you go to them, oh, by the way, Declan Rice is in this. All of a sudden, what bring, what comes with money? Ego. Mm. Okay. How much are Declan in for? hundred grand. Oh, I'm going to put two. Because all of a sudden they can go to their mates and go, I'm in the same thing with Declan mm. Rice. And I'm just using his name as an example. I'm yeah. in the same thing as Declan Rice. By the way, I only put one, I put two. Is it as bad as that? That's ego? how people see it. Yeah, that's how people see it. 
So you that you want footballers mm. attached. Mm. So I don't know if it's like that now, but when I was playing, it was certainly like that. And like my my conversation is different with a financial advisor now. I don't know what questions to ask. I didn't back then. My questions are, okay, is the bond, is it, is it um, FCA regulated? Is it regulated by the financial authorities? Because if it isn't, I can't touch it. Right, right. Is it asset backed? Which means, is what I'm putting my money into, is there an asset that's worth the same or more than what I'm putting in? But are, this, are these lessons learned because it went wrong for you somewhere or is it because you just educated yourself? Educated myself. Things went wrong for me in, in places, but I educated myself. To protect yourself in your, yeah. your the, the money you don't play in football, yeah. you know, your and career. I educated myself when I, like, when I retired, I started going to more business meetings. In the last three years of my career, when I was playing at South End, I used to go from South End into London just to go into business meetings with one of my business partners. Not to contribute, to listen and learn. And that's how I know about this. Now, is it, is it, is it asset backed? So what I'm putting my money into, is the asset worth more than how much I'm putting in? Because if it went, if something went wrong, we can sell the asset and I take my money back. And if it's a yes, yes on both of them, both of them um, questions, my next question, okay, how much money are you putting in then? if it's FCA regulated and it's asset back, that means it's very secure. So you must be putting money in as well then. Or are you putting money in, are you asking me to put money in it so you get a kick at the front and at the back? Are you getting a percentage at the front and the back? If that's what it is, then, then your answers to me are wrong then. It sounds to me like the lessons that you've experienced, the things you've experienced, Anton, and you're protecting your own, your family's, riches or wealth um, is because there are unscrupulous individuals out there who are taking young footballers for granted, for granted, 100%. Of the, and that's what it's about, is it? hundred percent. And, and it's like, like I said, and this is, this is the root of why there's problems in football, why there's mental health issues in problem uh, in football. Is this why you set up your agency? Um, yeah, I think my, if you look at, if you, research new era global sports management most people in the office have played football all the owners have, have played football right so they have an insight into the their exactly. Own experiences exactly and we're very big on mentorship we're very big on on personal experiences very very big on it and my passion now is living through them and seeing them be successful. I want all of the players that I speak to to be, have a better career than me. But I don't want them to go through the same things I went through. And if I can nip stuff in the bud before it gets to that, I've done my job. Example, a player has an argument with the manager. Anton, how did you deal with it? Well, I need to know, and if I know the manager, I know the manager's character. Mm. If not, I need to know a little bit more about the manager's character because then I can go, okay, this manager was like this mm. and I had an argument with this manager and mm. I spoke str and went at him the next day and went in his office and went in there and said, this is what I think, da, 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 and it didn't go well for me. Right, so you have an insight. Exactly. Mm. It's not me telling you, you can still go and do it the way you want to do it. I'm just giving you my mm. opinion and mm. what happened with me. Mm. But if I was you, because it didn't work for me in that way, I'll maybe wait a few days and then let the dust settle, then explain to him. Mm. Like it's a well-reported one with me and Steve Bruce. Mm. Me and Steve Bruce had an argument. The reason why we had an argument in the gym is because... He said things to me in front of players that, but he was he wasn't in his domain. If he would have said the stuff that he said to me in his dress in the dressing room or in his office, I would never have said a word to him. Right, because that's your workspace. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm in the gym, getting ready to go outside to try and get fit for him, and he's hammering me in front of people, in front of players and staff, and I'm like, "What? Excuse me? Are you like you taking a mic?" 
And I openly said to her, if you would have said this to me in, in your office or in your dressing room, I wouldn't have said a word. But you tr tried to treat me like I was a little kid. <laughs> and that's the type of reaction you will get. Mm. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but this is how it played out for me. Mm. So maybe I'm speaking to a, a, a younger player. Don't go back at him. Show him with your feet. Yeah. As I say, so let your feet do the talking. Let, let your me, feet do the talking. Yeah, let me ask you this. I, I listened to you talk about... Um, I listened to you talk about playing in the shadow of your brother, Rio. That's one thing. What I found really interesting was how you talked about protecting your own son and his footballing skills, abilities. I don't know what they are, how old he is or anything like that. But I kind of admired you sort of saying there was one interview where I listened where you sort of said you went into a shop and a guy said, I hope you're going to be better than your dad and your dad's brother, your uncle. And your reaction was very different from how you said your brother's reaction, Rio's action would be. What, what did you mean by that? And why is that important? Um, so obviously Rio don't know the feeling of being in someone's shadow. I do. And when you say that, you mean in his shadow? In his shadow. But you were a success in your own right. He was but successful, was but he's Rio. Was, you're, yeah, but it, it, was it? society never saw me as, as, as Anton for a long time. Football world didn't see me as Anton for a long time. They saw me as Rio's brother for a very, very long time. From the age of nine... To 22? No, till 20, 20, 21. But he's much older than you, yeah, Rob. he's seven years seven older years. than So he's, he's already carving out his career. So that's, and, that's and, an and obvious he, thing. And he's the best. He is the best. He's the best in the same, when we play the same position. Mm. And people would watch me for five minutes. I remember being nine years old, right, playing for West Ham. I went to go and collect the ball because the ball went off for a throw. I went to go and collect the ball. Parents of... Parents of the players on my team, you know, that played for West Ham, I'll never be as good as Rio, he's rubbish. And I'm hearing it. And I'm, here, and I'm nine years old, ten years old, I'm hearing these things. I'm Rio's brother. Because people would watch me for five minutes. If I didn't do something that I liken me to him, I was rubbish. Right. That is tough. I never got second chance. I didn't get chance after chance after chance. I had to go and hit the ground running. I had to. Or show something that made me look mentally strong for, for people to go, oh, okay, we'll give him another chance. Example, my um my debut for West Ham away at Portsmouth, away at not Portsmouth, away at Preston, North End, live on Sky. West Ham have just been relegated, so it's the first game of the, the next season. It's a big game. West Ham's a massive club in the championship. We are a massive club in the Premier League. Mm. Let me get that out of there. Mm. But in the Championship at the time. Not doing so well at the moment, though, are they? Yeah. And, no, they're not. It's live on Sky. First two minutes, it's my debut. Rio's in the stand. West Ham fans are behind the goal. First two minutes, I let them make a mistake. Goal. It's my fault for the goal. I'm walking back to my position. I'm looking into this. I love looking at the sky. Yeah. My thought process is, I ain't worked this hard to crumble. I represent too much. My family and my friends of where I came from. I wasn't the best out of my group of friends, but I'm the one here playing. Mm. I've got to represent them properly because there's some that should be here and not me. Anton, what are you going to do? You're going to sink or swim? You better start swimming. Didn't make a mistake again after the game, after that mistake. Started to carve your own career. Won, won the game. 2-1. That was the start of my career. Mm. If I didn't have that mindset, I'd, I'd never play again. My career's finished because I, I don't get second chances because I'm Rio's brother. And that, is, that, is the rea that, that was my reality. So when that goes to my son and why me and Rio are probably a little bit different with our children in football, he's probably more relaxed than I am because he don't know what it feels like to be in the shadow of somebody, whereas I do. Mm. West Ham, have, West Ham have watched my son from young, from he was in Little Kickers at four or five years old. And they wanted him to come in, Anton, bring him in to train. And I was like, no. And then one day he said, Dad, can I go in? And I went, okay, I'll take you. I'll never forget it. Hack, the coach, Hacks, he said, oh, we're going to put Flynn inside with the academy. And I went, no, no, he's going outside. 
And he went, no, no, we know he's good enough. I said, no, I don't care. He's going, in, he's going outside with the foundation. And afterwards, he come to me and he, I, said, I said, you've got to be outside for at least a month to six weeks. And he was like, oh, we know he's good enough. And he pulled me after. He went, listen, I watched the session. It's too good for he's, He should be inside. And I said, Hax, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. Mm. Is he going to get opportunities because of his name? Yes, he is. Because I got opportunities because of my name. But what he has to understand from now is, I can't get on. I can't step on the pitch with him. He has to do it, not me. So he has to earn the right to go inside. So he don't think from now at nine years old that I'm here because of my dad. But that that must be a big challenge because, like you said, the coach hack was saying that he was good enough to be in there, but you were thinking, no, you're doing that because he's a Ferdinand. You're doing that because he comes from a breed of footballers. You know, that goes way beyond you and your brother, Les, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, don't you feel, last question from me, don't you feel that that would hamper your son? Where you're trying to protect him from... It's a life lesson. Right. It's a life lesson. Nothing's free, which is more important. He might not be a footballer, but what he's going to take from football is soft skills that you can take into any sector and into life. Mm. And this is why I created Ferdinand Football Group in Essex. We've got 1,500 kids. We're only two years old. And we've got 1,500 kids across the whole of Essex, which is, is, is decent for, for a small business or a startup, I should say. Right? Out of that 1,500, one of them making it is, light, is highly unlikely. But if Ferdinand Football Group creates 300 good human beings with work ethic and they're successful in anything else they're doing, and they've used the soft skills that they've learned playing football as kids, which is a work ethic, discipline, people skills, which you need in life, by the way, in any sector you're in. But a lot of them kids don't have it nowadays because they're too much on their tablet. Mm. Yeah. If it, if Fernand Football Group creates two, three hundred of them good human beings, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a success. Mm. Mm. And it's the same for my son. He's no different to anybody else. I never, ever, ever, oh, I'm Rio's brother, so I should get, no, 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 no. I understand I might get an opportunity, but I have to work harder than every other person here because when the opportunity comes, I get one chance. Mm. And I need to be ready. So it's a life lesson for him. And I'd rather the life lesson than giving him the easy option. What does second chance mean to you? You mentioned it a couple of times. Like I said, making a mistake that costs a goal. If I don't perform after that, that's my second chance in the game. If I make another mistake and I'm, I never play again, I don't sit here as Anton Ferdinand, the footballer, because I don't have a career. It's a fact. But you'd still be Anton Ferdinand. Yeah. But and the success, not the, maybe not the footballer, but you like you want with your son, you would still have been, but I, I get been, it. I would have been successful in something else sure. because of the way I was brought up. Hmm. I weren't, wasn't allowed to sit on my bum. Hmm. I weren't allowed to, to, to go to Lewisham or go into Peckham and loiter. I weren't allowed to do that stuff because with that comes trouble. With that becomes complacency. So even now, I go gym every, most mornings I go gym. There's only, I go four out of five days in the, in the working week, yeah? I go to the gym. Dad, did you go gym today? Of course I did. Routine. Mm. My kids need to, not just my son, my daughter, they need to understand they need stru you need structure in life. You need to mentally be on it. Dad, I'll be going shop. Dad, where you going? I'm going to work. I've got to go and do something. I've got to go and do work. They need to hear work. Mm. Daddy's working. Daddy's working. They need to hear that. Not daddy's retired. Daddy's retired. No, no, no. I might be retired, but I still got the same work ethic. Daddy's working. I oh, went to Centre Parks this weekend. You know why you went to Centre Parks? Because Daddy goes to work. Nothing's free in this world, whether your name's Ferdinand or Joe Bloggs. Nothing's free. You've got to work for everything. So why should my kids be any different to anybody else? And that's just the life lesson that I want to give my, my children.
and it comes across very powerfully. Anton, thank, thank you. you so much no problem. for thank sharing. You. It, no it, it's so interesting. You talk so passionately about everything that you talk about. It's quite scary, actually, you know what that is? you have such passion in whatever you do down to your kids. It's very powerful. Thank you for watching or listening to the Second Chance podcast, where we share stories of redemption, hope, resilience and second chances. Who deserves a second chance? Who has the right to give someone a second chance and is a second chance even deserved? That's what Second Chance is all about. So subscribe if you want to be kept up to date with new episodes.